<laughs> okay, so um, I thank you for inviting me. It's been a very nice trip so far. And um, essentially, uh, what I've decided to do was uh, break up my lecture into uh, these uh, different. Um, Oh, okay. Into these different topics um, over the course of the next two days. Um, in general, I like the um, seminars to be informal, and especially since there's a language issue, if you guys have any questions, feel free to stop me. Um, and that way, I don't waste time, you know, talking about stuff that you don't understand. Um, I was also asked to give a little background about. Uh, myself, which is a little strange. But anyway, here we go. So um, my scientific background. Oh yeah, sorry, go ahead. Grazie per avermi invitato qui e finora è stato un, uh, un viaggio veramente molto piacevole. Uh, quelli che avete visto nella slide precedente sono gli argomenti di cui vorrei parlarvi in queste due giornate di oggi e di domani. Generalmente uh, quello che io eh, cerco di fare è di tenere degli incontri che siano il più informali possibili. Eh, quindi se avete qualsiasi tipo di domanda sentitevi assolutamente liberi di eh, eh, interrompermi e di pormi qualsiasi dubbio o domanda che vi venga in mente in qualsiasi momento. Non, non vorrei passare il tempo, sprecare il tempo parlandovi di cose che per voi non sono interessanti. Quindi vorrei iniziare anzitutto dandovi un, un background ground della mia storia del mio percorso. Okay. So, I'm actually from California. Uh, uh, there is Los Angeles. And I was actually born about uh, and raised about 20 miles uh, east of Los Angeles. And uh, my undergraduate degree um, when I first went to college, I I was under the impression that I was going to become a medical doctor. And um, so I chose to go to um, a university near the capital of California in Sacramento uh, at UC Davis, which is a primarily an agricultural school. And I chose that school over others because it, uh, in Los Angeles it's very metropolitan and when I first went to Davis it looked like an agricultural school so I felt I was in a foreign land. So I thought this would be something interesting to try. Should I stop? This could be long. <laughs> this is going to be long. <laughs> Go ahead. Ok, fine, fine. Eh, allora, vengo dalla California, sono nato in California, eh, preci più precisamente a 20 miglia circa ad est di Los Angeles. Eh, inizialmente, quando sono, ho iniziato il mio percorso universitario, ho scelto un'università a Sacramento, quindi non lontano da lì, eh, ed era più che altro una scuola agricola, diciamo. Eh, Visto che eh, Los Angeles è una città piuttosto metropolitana, eh, Sacramento e questa scuola mi sembrava quasi una terra straniera e quindi ho pensato fosse molto interessante cominciare il mio percorso lì. Um, so, so my family did not go to college and we didn't have much resources, so as part of the program there, uh, to attend the university uh, required that I had to work. And so I got actually a job as a uh, research assistant, which was my first exposure uh, to research uh, work in a laboratory. Um, and that kind of started changing my perspective on what I actually wanted to do uh, with my life. Eh, devo dire che nessuno nella mia famiglia aveva mai frequentato un'università e inoltre la mia famiglia non aveva eh, così tante risorse, eh, quindi proprio per questo io ho dovuto cominciare subito a lavorare, a collaborare con l'università e ho cominciato un lavoro come assistente di ricerca presso un laboratorio e questo ha cambiato decisamente la mia prospettiva eh, di vita. And so, um, uh, so this is actually an example of actually where life kind of changed my perspective on uh, actually what I wanted to do. So after I graduated um, UC San Diego, uh, my mother got very sick with diabetes, so I had to go home uh, to help uh, take care of her. And during that time, I worked at the um, University of Southern California at the Norris Cancer Center, whereas I was introduced to cancer research uh, work. And again, I wasn't planning to go into research. I actually got accepted to medical school, 
but due to family reasons, I, I needed to uh, go home. So I, I took a job at uh, USC. Uh, quindi questo ha cambiato come dicevo la mia prospettiva di vita dopo essermi laureato sono dovuto tornare a casa perché eh, mia madre si era ammalata di diabete uh, quindi ho cominciato a collaborare con l'università del sud della California uh, collaborando proprio uh, nell'ambito della ricerca sul cancro uh, quindi diciamo che la scelta è stata dovuta più che altro a motivi legati alla mia famiglia So um, after that, I, um, to stay near home, I decided to do my uh, PhD. So I, I gave up my medical school admission and entered the PhD program at the University of California at uh, San Diego, UCSD, which is in uh, San Diego. And together, so what um, happened when I was taking these uh, responsibilities at uh, USC, I was studying how basically cancer cells can avoid being um, attacked by the immune system, what makes them uh, basically immune privilege, uh, that uh, the immune system doesn't see them as a foreign, um, uh, a foreign cell type. And so when I was going to graduate school, I was interested in how, does, how do cells avoid um, the immune system, right? And the major example that I wanted to study when in graduate school was how do viruses avoid the immune system from recognizing them and destroying them. So um, the problem when I uh, attended UCSD was there's three professors that worked on that topic, uh, but the year I joined, they all decided to leave the university to go elsewhere. So I had to, to find something else. So what I uh, ended up studying as a graduate student was how does proteins move from one compartment of the cell to another? So I studied uh, intracellular uh, vesicle trafficking as, as a graduate student. Uh, successivamente uh, ho iniziato un programma di dottorato presso la città di San Diego uh, e ho cominciato proprio ad avere delle responsabilità ben più, uh, più impegnative. Ho cominciato a studiare il modo in cui le cellule del, del cancro possono evitare di essere attaccate uh, e... Uh, Ero molto interessato a questo argomento, ho voluto approfondire anche il tema dei virus eh, e all'inizio la mia ricerca è stata sostenuta da tre professori che lavoravano proprio su questo argomento, in questo campo. Eh, in un secondo momento questi professori hanno lasciato l'università eh, e quindi ho cominciato ad approfondire l'argomento delle proteine, del modo in cui le proteine si spostano da, un, da una parte all'altra. And uh, so at the end of my graduate uh, work, I became interested after reading a review about how does organs determine their size, right? And I was particularly interested in the liver because you can cut two thirds of the liver off and it can regenerate. And the question was, why can the liver do it and other, other organs cannot? And another interesting thing is that when you transplant an organ from a donor to recipient, it will either grow or shrink based on the size of the original organs. So I was very interested in how did the microenvironment dictate uh, a formed organ to change its uh, morphology. But the problem with that, that this was in 1999-2000, and at that point, a lot of the work done in that field in stem cells was primarily clinical, where they would throw drugs on tissues and cells and look what happened, and I wasn't interested in that type of work. Um, so the other organ that has remarkable uh, regenerative properties, of course, is the skin. Um, so what I did is that I applied for a postdoc from UCSD to the University of Chicago in Illinois uh, with Elaine Fuchs. And that's when I started my uh, work uh, using the skin as a model system to study both stem cells and uh, regeneration. <laughs> Uh, ho cominciato quindi ad approfondire il tema, a concentrarmi sugli organi, al modo in cui gli organi uh, determinano i, siti, i, i loro siti all'interno del corpo uh, e quindi uh, ho cominciato ad approfondire anche il tema del trapianto di organi, uh, proprio come microambiente, diciamo il modo in cui questo cambia la morfologia. Uh, questi studi sono legati al periodo fine novecento inizio anni 2000, quindi 999-2000, ehm, 
ho cominciato quindi a parlare, a, a concentrarmi anche sull'utilizzo di medicinali, di farmaci in questo campo e successivamente mi sono spostato all'Università di Chicago dove ho cominciato a lavorare eh, proprio sull'aspetto sull della pelle eh, per, studiare in modo, eh, per studiare in modo più particolare proprio le cellule eh, dell'epidermide e la rigenerazione cellulare. Ok, so... Two years into my postdoc, uh, my advisor decided to move the lab to New York at Rockefeller University. So I spent uh, two years also in New York. And then for my first faculty position, um, I got tired of the cold weather, so I decided to uh, go back to San Diego, which is like the Leche of California. Um, and that's when I started the work um, that I'm going to talk about primarily uh, of the wound healing in the skin. So I got my um, training in uh, UCSD as a biochemist cell biology. And then I learned developmental genetics as a postdoc. And the idea that we have is to try to marry both of those types of approaches to understand how the skin uh, regenerates itself, uh, both in normal turnover, but as an also response to uh, damage. Eh, a un certo punto però ero stanco del clima freddo e quindi mi sono spostato a New York, sono stato lì per due anni, eh, scusate mi sono, sono stato prima a New York per due anni, poi mi sono spostato a, a San Diego ehm, e eh, diciamo che San Diego è un po' la, la lecce della California quindi sicuramente si stava molto meglio. Ho cominciato a studiare la riparazione tissutale nella, nella pelle e, e per vedere proprio la formazione all'interno dell'ambito della biologia cellulare e cercando di capire proprio il funzionamento della rigenerazione della pelle eh, sia in, in una situazione standard normale in un soggetto sano che eh, in soggetti con danni. Ok, and then so a couple of years ago the uh, opportunity to um, help set up a stem cell institute in India uh, came up. So I decide I have a small group still in San Diego, but I decided to move most of the effort um, in San Diego. And at first I was a little at unease uh, of this thing and I have a twin brother and he thought I was going crazy uh, because uh, this is how San Diego looks like, UCSD, and this is what our impression of India was, like what's what's going on <laughs> kind of a stuff. But what was surprising when I got there was there is a very strong uh, emphasis, uh, almost like what China is doing, in, in trying to raise the research profile. So if you look at the facilities that are present in India, they're as good if not better than some of the facilities that I had uh, uh, in the different institutes that I've been in in uh, the United States. Eh, due anni fa ho avuto l'opportunità di spostarmi verso un istituto in India, eh, anche se avevo ancora un piccolo gruppo a San Diego. Eh, All'inizio ero un po' spaventato, anche il mio, mio fratello gemello era spaventato perché... Eh, come avete visto nelle immagini, l'India è un paese totalmente diverso, quindi la prospettiva era abbastanza preoccupante per lui e anche per me spostarsi da San Diego all'India. Eh, in realtà poi eh, il lavoro eh, si è svolto eh, abbastanza bene e mi sono concentrato più che altro eh, sul... Su, su quello che si faceva all'interno di questo istituto, cioè anche in India si cercava diciamo, di, di aumentare, di risollevare il profilo della ricerca in, questi, in questo campo. So the institute that I'm at is the Institute for Stem Cell Biology and Regenerative Medicine. And as the uh, slide says, we're interested in the basic and translational research in uh, stem cells. Um, the setup is uh, slightly different. Uh, in that we don't have departments in the um, institute. Um, so what we uh, did is that we designed themes in which people with uh, common interests would get together. And the idea is that uh, multiple people coming together can accomplish more than an individual investigator can on its own. And uh, there's uh, six different themes that are uh, present. So you have the Center for Brain Development and Repair, uh, the Center for Cardiovascular Biology and Disease, the Center for Chemical Biology and Therapeutics, a program on stem cell potency, 
And a technology for the advancement of sciences is basically like the institute that I just visited, which is all the um, major uh, equipment and um, high-tech um, equipment that are required to do uh, basic uh, front-end science. And I'm actually the coordinator for a joint center for inflammation and t uh, tissue homeostasis, which is a collaborative um, um, work with this institute in Italy, IFOM, the Institute for Molecular Oncology in Milan. So that's why I go there often. So we're trying to develop this uh, particular center in connection with IFOM in order to understand tissue homeostasis and the diseases that uh, arise when it goes wrong, which, uh, you know, the major example would be cancer. Okay, that's, <laughs> I think that's self-explanatory. No? Move on. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to go fast on this kind of a stuff. So essentially, um, what we are trying to understand, and we use various model systems to understand it, but we are trying to look at wound healing in the skin as a model to understand how you mobilize stem cells to repair a tissue, right? And uh, in wound healing, it's been categorized into three different phases. An inflammatory phase, a proliferative phase, and a remodeling phase. And I'll go over that uh, during the course of my talk. And what's quite interesting is that uh, there's this uh, relatively old um, idea that's coming, uh, having a renaissance, that a lot of diseases have a wound signature. So you can think of various diseases such as diabetes, inflammatory diseases, and cancer, which basically perturb one or more of those processes that normally occur during wound healing. So the idea then is if we understand the normal regulation of inflammation, proliferation, and remodeling during a physiological response, we probably have an idea of what goes wrong in diseases when those processes become deregulated. Um, allora, quindi ho cominciato, ho continuato a lavorare proprio sulla riparazione tissutale sulla pelle per capire il modo in cui lavorano le cellule staminali. Eh, questo attraverso tre fasi, tre fasi di riparazione, eh, che sono quelle che vedete lì, le prime tre, l'infiammazione, la proliferazione e il remodeling, quindi il, il plasmare, plasmare le cellule, eh, e ho, mh, ho approfondito proprio questo. Questi, questi processi all'interno del quando questi processi sono collegati alle malattie, vedendo che eh, le malattie che vedete lì nella slide eh, sono legate spesso a una, due o a tutte e tre le fasi. Okay. Skip this. Um, Vado avanti. Yeah. So I'll go over this in my talk. But I just wanted to uh, mention that again that um, This uh, Center for Inflammation Tissue Homeostasis, which we call SIP, is a joint in initiative with uh, IFOM in Milan. And um, so the, the, what they, the expertise they bring to the table is that they have uh, various expertise in different uh, aspects of cancer. So you know, um, DNA repair response, uh, re repair and recombination, uh, cancer metastasis, signaling. And what we do is basically we can interface with them to try to understand a deregulated form of the same signaling pathways we're, under, we're trying to understand in a normal physiological context. Um, so we've been uh, looking for two additional faculty uh, to join us in uh, INSTEM uh, as part of this group in order to help build a critical mass. And um, the area that we've been looking at is basically cancer stem cells and the formation of tumor stroma. And so, in general, this uh, INSTEM is where I'm at, uh, is part of a, a triad of institutions with the National Center for Biological Sciences and this CCAMP, which is the Center for Cellular and Molecular Platforms. So this is our technology um, uh, institute. Uh, this is basic biology, and this is more specialized in stem cells. So the idea is to marshal those three in conjunction with EFOM in order to form uh, a core group of institutions in order to kind of advance uh, the, um, our goal of trying to uh, understand and utilize the power of regenerative medicine to combat disease. 
Eh, questo centro, il centro che avete visto nelle diapositive precedenti, il CIT, collabora con l'IFOM eh, e quindi collabora con un gruppo di esperti eh, in diversi settori che riguardano il cancro. Eh, abbiamo chiesto anche ad altri due istituti di unirsi al nostro, alla no, al nostro lavoro eh, proprio sulla formazione degli stroma e, delle, e del cancro alle cellule eh, e quindi diciamo che abbiamo deciso di formare un gruppo con tutti questi istituti che andasse nella stessa direzione nell'ambito della ricerca. Um, so what I'll do now is I'll talk some about our, our uh, most recent work on trying to understand the cellular and molecular basis of wound healing and since there is a uh, actual strong interest in oncology here Uh, I was going to try to um, draw some connections of what uh, insights that wound healing can teach us about the progression of various cancers. Okay. Huh? He said that there's no need for the translation now that you, you will be ah, but but okay. So, uh, if, so if we don't need translation, just feel free to stop me if anything is not clear. That, I think, would be best. Okay. Okay, so um, why use the skin as a model system then uh, to understand what I told you our interest is, tissue morphogenesis, homeostasis, and cancer? Um, so essentially, the skin is comprised of two different uh, compartments. You have the upper layer of the epidermis that's separated uh, by a basin membrane from the underlying dermis. So there's basically two compartments within the skin, okay? An epithelial compartment at the top and a mesenchymal compartment in the um, bottom. This, it's, uh, I'm oversimplifying, but for, that, for the purpose of this talk, that's what it is. Um, so the advantages of using the skin as a model system is, of course, it's accessible and abundant material, right? So you can see changes on the surface of the animal when we do genetic uh, mutations. And we, uh, since the skin is the largest organ of the body, uh, when we want to uh, isolate either the uh, stem cells, the epithelial stem cells or the mesenchymal stem cells in the tissue, it's actually quite easy to do. Um, and a lot of work by the anatomists have uh, uh, already defined the lineage and spatial um, um, progression or physiology of this um, of this organ. So we know where the cells come from and then what they become. And what you know, honestly, we're trying to do is just put the molecular details in the work that the anatomists have already um, established in the field. So we know from their work that the epithelial compartment, um, which is the, this epidermis here, is all derived from one common embryonic skin progenitor cell. So that same progenitor cell gives rise to epidermis, the sebaceous gland, as well as this hair follicle. Okay, so one stem cell can uh, uh, divide into, uh, become three different uh, tissues. The other thing is that the adult skin epithelium undergoes massive turnover. <clears throat> so it's been uh, estimated in a normal, I guess I would say American adult because we're kind of battered. It's 4,000 cells per minute are lost from the surface of your body, of, of skin cells, right? So that means that in order to keep replacing this tissue, the cell has to, the tissue has to constantly regenerate throughout the lifetime of the animal, okay? Because you're losing 40,000 cells at the surface. So this is a powerful... Um, system to understand the regeneration of a tissue that occurs normally just to maintain uh, homeostasis. Um, the other benefit is that we can culture these epithelial stem cells without losing their stemness, right? We can culture them for about, you know, up to 20 passages and put them back into a mouse and they'll reconstitute epidermis, sebaceous gland, and hair follicle, right? So the stemness is maintained within, within tissue culture. Um, from the standpoint of disease, the epithelial skin, uh, skin cancers are the most prevalent worldwide. Okay, so what is the uh, anatomy of this epidermis? I'm going to be focusing on, again, this top layer of the, of the skin. So this epidermis is what's called a stratified epithelia. It's a multi-layer um, uh, tissue of epithelial cells, and they're all keratinocytes. So you have this uh, basement membrane here, which is this part that separates the epider uh, epidermis from the underlying uh, dermis. And you have multiple layers. So the bottom layer is called the basal layer, and this is where your stem cells reside. Okay, so these guys are dividing in order to produce the um, cells that are needed because as the cells migrate up, they enter a terminal differentiation program. So they become, they exit the cell cycle and become differentiated 
And it's a terminal differentiation program because the end result is the death of the cells. So you lose the cells at the surface of the tissue. This is where that 40,000 cells lost per minute come from because as soon as the cells leave this layer, they're destined to die, right? And you're going to need to proliferate these cells in order to maintain this uh, pool of progenitor cells, but also to replace the cells that are lost near the surface of the tissue, okay? And we can monitor the progression of the cells through this differentiation program through various markers. So this layer is marked by keratin 5. The next layer is marked by keratin 1. You can uh, see Lorgren at the uppermost layer, and then the dead cells you can just tell by histology. Okay, so we can we have a system to monitor where in this differentiation program the um, cells are in. <clears throat> so again, in order or, in order to maintain homeostasis, which is bas basically maintain the tissue, you have a balancing act of uh, of opposing processes. So again, you, I was telling you guys that uh, basically you can lose forty thousand cells per minute. So how do you maintain this this constant thickness of the epidermis? <clears throat> so there's two decisions that have to be made. At this basal layer, the cells have to decide whether to proliferate or to differentiate, right? Proliferate to maintain the pool of progenitor cells or differentiate in order to replace the cells that are ultimately lost at the surface of the tissue. The second decision has to be made whether these cells are going to, at the top, do they survive or do they die? And you can think of any kind of changes in any of these decisions can affect the um, uh, morphology of the tissue. So if we look at the bottom uh, decision, this normally occurs during physiological process. So during wound healing, you need more progenitor cells to rebuild the tissue. So there's more proliferation that occurs in the stem cells. However, what's found in aging as you get older, that there's less stem cells there and they become more prone to differentiation. So the uh, ability to um, adapt to damage is somewhat perturbed due to aging because this balance is lost. And various diseases also take advantage of this balance here. So various carcinomas, uh, common skin diseases such as psoriasis and eczema or atopic dermatitis all seem to perturb this towards the proliferative side, whereas when you have sunburn, Cushing syndrome, or lupus, that favors the differentiation of the tissue. Okay. So again, any changes in this balance, which occurs normally because this, it's required for normal um, physiological processes such as wound healing, but diseases take advantage of this and perturb that balance, and that's to a large extent what causes the disease. Okay, so the question then is that you have a normal balance in uh, proliferation and differentiation during normal homeostasis, when the, the tissue is just normally existing. However, as I mentioned, upon injury, you get this um, imbalance toward proliferation because you need more building blocks to repair the tissue. Okay, so the question then is how does this injury get translated into this, right? How does the, how does the, what is the signaling pathways that link this to this process here? So to go over that, uh, I'll just talk a little about the uh, three phases of the wound healing response, which I introduced earlier in the uh, background is that the first one is the inflammatory response where you get the recruitment of immune cells into the tissue, right? And as you guys all probably know, the skin is the major barrier that protects you from the outside as well as to prevent the water loss. So when you have a breach in this barrier, the immune cells are basically like the army of the body that comes to the side of the wound to prevent infection and microbes from penetrating that barrier, okay? So basically this is thought to be a protective uh, mechanism. Um, the second phase of the wound healing response is uh, proliferation, and some of the things that occur is the proliferation of the skin stem cells. Again, remember we need to make more stem cells in order to rebuild the tissue, and you have the formation of new structures such as angiogenesis, which is the formation of new blood vessels to vascularize the tissue. And then the third and most uh, the latest response is this remodeling response where you have cell-cell junctions and cell-ECM interactions need to be remodeled in order to make the, the tissue look like it did before it was damaged. Okay? And this is actually an important point that I'll get to uh, uh, in subsequent lectures in my talk, because do you guys know what the major difference is between regeneration and repair? Let's make this interactive, huh? What? I mean, she, she was in my lab, so. <laughs> so basically, it's scar formation, right? So regeneration is the perfect reproduction of the tissue that was there. You can tell repair because there is, it's imperfect, and part of the imperfect, imperfect, imperfectness 
I don't know if that's word, but anyway, is the um, formation of a scar, right? And that's how various pathologists can tell that you had a broken bone or some kind of damage years after um, uh, it happened by the remnants of the scar tissue, right? Because it's not a perfect replica of the tissue. Now, the problem with this field is that people were very good at uh, recapitulating the individual phases by themselves. But what became um, kind of um, apparent was even though they're classified as different phases, there's substantial crosstalk between the cells that mediate one phase versus the cells that mediate another phase. So for instance, immune cells can secrete cytokines that can promote blood vessel formation and the proliferation of skin stem cells, right? The, both the uh, immune cells and the stem cells can secrete enzymes that remodel the ECM, like matrix metalloproteinases, right? That remodel ECM to make them look normal. Now the problem, and the other thing is that the ECM, the extracellular matrix, is a strong pool for growth factors, so it's very sticky. When you remodel the growth factors, they release those, oh, sorry, when you remodel the extracellular matrix, they release the growth factors that can then work back on the cells to affect the behavior of these cells, right? So it's become clear that they're all interrelated and it's very difficult to study each thing in isolation. Oh, okay. <clears throat> so the other thing that is quite interesting on part of this is that, as I mentioned, these are the same kind of phases that occur during disease. And this is a very old hypothesis because in 1863, Rudolf Dirkow uh, was the first to propose that there's a correlation that he noticed that tumors formed more often when there was past uh, episodes of tissue injury or irritation. So uh, tissues that were da uh, damaged or stressed had a higher frequency of tumor formation than, than non-stressed tissue. And then in 1972, a uh, Harvard pathologist basically showed that some of the same things that occur during a wound healing response are also reproduced in cancer. And that's um, pictorially um, depicted here. So in a wound, you get the uh, infiltration of immune cells to help fight off disease. And if you look at an invasive tumor, within the stroma, there's multiple immune cells that are present and work by multiple labs, uh, such as Michael Karen and um, Lisa Cousins, has shown that these immune cells signal to the cancer cells that affect their proliferation and their migration. Right. In wound healing, you have the formation of new blood vessels. And in uh, tumors, you get just an exaggerated form of that blood vessel formation. In uh, wounds, in order to close the uh, gap in the tissue, you have these uh, epidermal keratinocytes migrating over the wound bed to close the gap within the tissue. It's similar to what happens here in a deregulated form of a metastatic tumor. You have cell migrations, but they just break through the basement membrane and start metastasizing. So the idea then is that this cancer it's just uh, an exaggerated form of what occurs during uh, wound healing. <clears throat> okay, so again, the idea is that if we understand this, we might have insights onto uh, cancer biology. Now, um, the other problem when studying this field is that I was telling you that inflammation, proliferation, and remodeling are interconnected. So we need a system that can recapitulate the crosstalk between those different cells. The other issue that occurs is the uh, type of cells that respond. So it's not coming out very well, but this red line basically marks the epidermis of a, of a skin. Okay, so it's very thin here. If you wound the animal, what happens is there's a localized thickening of the epidermis, which is the proliferative response where the stem cells start um, proliferating to try to close the gap within the wound, which is on this side. But what this picture is supposed to point out is you can see there's a gradient of a response of the tissue, right? It's highest near the wound, but as you go away, the tissue starts looking normal. So at this section here, you can't really tell any difference from this section here. So how do you study a system that basically has a heterogeneous response? It's very difficult to take this tissue and then say, you know, one third of this uh, tissue is going to have a wound healing effect, whereas the other is normal. So you have a problem with signal to noise ratio, right? So this is basically diluting out the signals that you have here. So uh, when I first started my lab, we were looking for a genetic model system that would basically turn the entire epidermis into a wound, right? So we could overcome that problem there. So what we came upon was uh, studying this protein caspase 8, okay? So 
Are you guys familiar with Caspi-Z? Apoptosis? Okay. Well, I'm going to tell you it's not an apoptotic function. <laughs> so essentially, caspase 8 is well known as a component of apoptosis. So you have this extrinsic apoptotic pathway, which is activated by a ligand binding to receptor. So in this case, the FAST ligand and FAST, which is the receptor. And that leads to the uh, recruitment and acti uh, activation of caspase 8. And caspase 8 gets proteically cleaved and then can act, uh, activate the executioner caspases, leading to apoptosis. Okay, this is the canonical pathway of, uh, of caspase 8 in the extrinsic, extrinsic apoptotic pathway. The problem with this model is it doesn't fit in what we see in the epidermis. Okay, so I told you that the cells at the top of the epidermis are dead, right? The terminal differentiation program, they die. This is not an apoptotic form of cell death. Okay, so that was the first thing that kind of clued us in. Why is this here if this is not an apoto apoptotic death? They're dying, but in a totally different uh, way. The second thing that um, kind of um, clued us in was the downstream components of caspase 8 is caspase 3 and 7. They're not even expressed in the same cells. Caspase 3 and 7 are in cells in the basal layer. Caspase 8 is up there. Okay, so this signaling pathway is not even intact within the same cell. Okay, so what is that uh, doing there? So what we found is that when we looked at caspase 8 during a wound healing response, we found some dynamic expression which was actually kind of interesting. So to orient you guys, this is zero hours after wounding. This is the uh, wound that we uh, placed on the back skin of the animal. Okay, so we basically cut a hole in the skin of the mouth. This black dotted line is the basement membrane that separates the epidermis on top from the dermis at the bottom. So here's that black dotted line, epidermis on top, dermis at the bottom. The brown staining you see here is an in situ hybridization for caspase 8 RNA. Okay, so this is the caspase 8, this brown is the caspase 8 RNA level. If you look seven hours or one hour after wounding, you can see that there's a loss of caspase 8 expression. You can already see a, a slight thickening of the epidermis relative to uh, the normal uh, wound, uh, normal uh, epidermal thickening site. At day seven, the epidermis is very, very thick, and caspase eight is still gone. Okay. When the wound completely closes, the epidermis thins out again, and caspase eight gets turned back on. Right. So it's turned off during a wound healing response, and then when the wound is closed, it gets turned on. So the question is, does this switch turn off of the caspase eight? Is that relevant? to a wound healing response. If we just turn it off itself, can we recapitulate some aspect of wound healing? Okay, so again, caspase 8 is expressed near the surface of the epidermis. If we knock that out, what do we see in the mouth? So this is called a conditional knockout, where we knocked out caspase 8 only in the epidermis. Okay, And if you just look at the mouse, well, it's not coming out clear here, but if you look at a mouse, it's actually quite clear. So this is the normal wild-type littermate, and this is a knockout mouse. So there's a difference in size, and it, I don't know if you can see it here, but if you look closely, you can see just by looking at it, there's flakiness of the skin, right, which is indicative of a hyperproliferative response. So, and if we look uh, by uh, histology, which is H and E, so at the top is the wild type, and at the bottom is the caspase knockout. This thin line here is the epidermis. Below it is the dermis. You can see here that the epidermis is thicker relative to the dermis, and it becomes more clear if in higher magnification. Wild-type epidermis, caspase-8 knockout epidermis. And this is throughout the entire animal, right? So it's almost like the, the entire skin thinks that there's a wound healing response. And the other thing that we noticed here is that um, there's more cells in the dermis relative to the wild type here. And that's what's called dermal infiltrate, which is indicative of immune cells coming in to the tissue. And again, well, I'll show you data that they, they are indeed uh, immune cells. So the question then is, um, how does the loss of epidermal caspase A contribute to the wound healing response? Does it induce inflammation, proliferation, remodeling, or a combination of all three? Okay. And so what we did is, okay, just take the caspase A knockout and let's look at the immune cell recruitment into the tissue. So what uh, this slide uh, here shows is on the left is the wild type skin, and on the right is the knockout skin. And I'm not going to go too much in the details, but essentially different types of immune cells, which are in green, 
are higher in the caspase-8 knockout relative to its wild-type control. Okay, so and it, you have innate immune cells as well as adapted immune cells such as T cells. The green, in green is the T cells here relative to the wild type. There's a massive infiltration of immune cells as if they, uh, the uh, tissue thinks that there is damage. Okay, there's no need to in, um, cause the infiltration of immune cells because there's no break in the barrier. But the loss of caspase 8 is fooling the tissue into thinking that there's a break and you need immune cells to fight off infection. So there seems to be inflammation. What about proliferation? So the two uh, things that I'm going to show you are the proliferation of skin stem cells and the formation of new blood vessels. Okay, so um, there's the markers that we're using here in the wild type. Keratin-5, again, I told you, marks the basal layer, but it also marks the hair follicle. So in red is the epidermis and hair follicle, and underneath is the dermis. And Ki-67 is a marker of cells that are proliferating in green. Okay. So you can see that there's very few cells normally proliferating in the wild-type animal. However, in, when you remove the epidermal caspase 8, you see a massive inf uh, increase in the amount of cells proliferating in both the epidermis as well as the hair follicle. So again, it seems like the cells are responding to some type of damage that doesn't exist by increasing the, the um, proliferation of the stem cells within the tissue. And then also if you look at the blood vessels, which is in, uh, labeled in green, there's some vascularization in the wild type skin, but it's markedly increased in the caspase 8 knockout. Okay, so just uh, we have other things, but for the two uh, that I listed here, we're seeing proliferation as well as um, more blood vessels forming by just removing caspase 8. Okay, now what about this remodeling and cell and ECM um, aspect? Now, the reason, like I told you, you need remodeling is when you have an injury, the cells in the dermis, these fibroblasts, start secreting a lot of ECM, right? And they form this scar tissue here, right? But then as the um, tissue closes, you're going to need to kind of remove this scar tissue, which is basically an aggregation of extracellular proteins, extracellular matrix proteins. And the enzymes that are required for the resolution of this scar are basically matrix metalloproteinases, uh, atoms, and uh, uh, tissue plasminogen activator uh, protein. So various MMPs have been and atoms have been found in a different uh, wound environment. And what we found is that uh, about 90% of those, or 80% of those, are also activated in the caspase knockout. And I'm only showing you this graph because I'll get back to this aspect in a, in a subsequent lecture. But we're turning on enzymes that are required for the remodeling of the extracellular matrix. Okay, so what the data together shows is that upon wounding, there is a normal down regulation of caspase 8. That RNA level goes down, right? The loss of caspase 8 seems to be able to recapitulate inflammation, proliferation, and the remodeling phases of the wound healing response. And what we've been able to do is basically bypass this need for wound by genetically removing caspase 8, and that could initiate all these downstream pathways. Okay, but what we did was basically a genetic trick. Right? We, <laughs> it normally doesn't happen that you can knock out a gene. So the question that we had is, is this down regulation of caspase 8 really required normally for wound healing, uh, a proper wound healing uh, process? So if I was going to take an approach to see if this is required, we would need some kind of system that basically has a perturbed wound healing program. Can you guys think of any disease that has perturbed wound healing? Diabetes. Correct. So you guys know that diabetics, they get uh, ulcers uh, because of a failure to properly close a wound. And that leads to basically the amputation of the, uh, of the um, part of the body. Right? And we actually started thinking about this because um, Dana Graves published this paper in 2006 that uh, she didn't, uh, she was talk, talk about apoptosis, but she found that the various mRNAs of uh, caspases are higher in the um, apoptotic, uh, sorry, in the diabetic uh, wounds. So what we did is that we got a diabetic mouse and then asked, what is the fate of caspase 8 during wound healing? Okay, well, this is not coming out very well, but anyway. So in red is keratin 5, which marks the epidermis. This white dotted line again is the uh, um, basement membrane separating it from the dermis. 
and then here is the site where we made the wound. So you can see that the, cast, uh, the epidermis got thicker in response to this wound here. And in uh, green is caspase 8, and you don't see caspase 8 expression because I told you caspase 8 is turned off during wound healing response. Oh, this is not coming out either well. But anyway, in a diabetic mouth, what you can see here, I think you have to trust me, is that caspase 8 is still present. It's not turned off, right? So the question is, is this failure to turn off caspase 8 in this diabetic mouse, is that why it has this impaired wound healing response? So we can test that because we have the genetic tools to do that. So what we basically do is cut a hole in the back of the mouse, no, not the, the back skin of the mouse, and um, essentially measure the closure rate. So in a wild type mouse where you make an area, a wound of an area of 22 uh, square millimeters, 20 square millimeters, it takes about 12 days to close that hole in the tissue. In a diabetic mouse, it takes about 24 days to do it, okay? So you've doubled the time required for uh, closure, but that also doubles the amount of time that can, uh, the tissue can get infected. Okay, remember, this diabetic, this downregulates caspase 8. This does not downregulate caspase 8. What if we genetically downregulate caspase 8 in this uh, diabetic mouse model? And when we do that, you can restore to a large extent the time of uh, wound closure almost back to wild type levels. Okay, so this told us that you do need to downregulate caspase E as a normal wound healing response because when you don't, you delay wound healing and you can uh, largely correct it by just forcefully downregulating caspase E expression levels. Okay, <clears throat> so now this tells us then that caspase E regulation is actually quite important. But the next question then is how does the loss of caspase E stimulate epithelial stem cell proliferation? Right? And this actually is a, a very interesting cell, biolog cell biological problem, a problem because, as I mentioned, caspase 8 is expressed near the surface of the tissue. But the epithelial stem cells are at the bottom of the tissue here. And there's some in the hair follicles here. Right? So we're, I'm saying that you're playing with the protein near the surface of the tissue, but the cells that are responding are deeper within the tissue. What is mediating this communication? between the top of the tissue and cells deeper within it, okay? So it's actually, again, a wound causes a downregulation of caspase 8, and somehow this leads to the activation of these stem cells to start proliferating, right, in both the epidermis as well as the hair follicle, okay? As I showed you that KI67 thing, you remember you saw green all over the place there. How is the loss of that uh, protein at the top leading to the proliferation of these cells at the bottom? Okay. So, and not only that, it's actually quite interesting, I'll get to it, is that the hair follicle stem cells that normally are required to reform the hair because your hair falls out, and for most of us here, it grows back. <laughs> uh, so they normally grow, go down to reform a hair follicle. During wounds, the hair follicle stem cells proliferate, but they get redirected to go up to the epidermis, right? So this is a self-fate change. The hair follicles, they detect a problem with the, the tissue, because we're not going to form hair follicle, we're going to change our fate, migrate up, and become epidermal keratinocytes. Okay? So how do we find out what is the pathway leading <coughs> these two phenomena? Okay, so the assay for identifying the secreted uh, proliferation promoting factors was done uh, this way. So essentially we took the um, tissue from both the wild type um, skin and separated the epidermis from the dermis. And what we do is condition media basically to collect everything that is secreted out from this um, epidermis and then profiled it and found that there is three, 23 different cytokines that are higher in the knockout epidermis, secreted higher in the knockout epidermis than the wild type. So they're secreting something that's promoting proliferation. Uh, we did a lot of different work on the different cytokines. And what I want to talk to you about today is the uh, secretion of interleukin-1 alpha. Okay, so the cytokine IL-1 alpha. And what you can see is that there's a marked increase in the amount of um, IL-1 alpha secreted from the knockout epidermis versus the wild type epidermis. Okay, so the question is, what is this increased IL-1 alpha doing? So we asked then, the, in the wound, you have a downregulation down of caspase 8, and this leads to increased secretion of IL-1 alpha. Does this affect different aspects of this uh, wound healing response? And in particular, can it affect the proliferation of these skin stem cells? 
so what we first did was that is IL-1 alpha important for skin cell, stem cell proliferation? And a way of testing it is that if we had a wound, we'll have more IL-1 alpha and that would affect whatever it does. If we make the cells insensitive to IL-1 alpha by doing it on a receptor knockout animal, so the animal lacks the receptor for IL-1 alpha. So even though IL-1 alpha is present, the cell is incapable of sensing that uh, signal. Okay, so this is one way of short circuiting the IL-1 signal. And what you can see here is that here's the normal proliferating stem cells in the unwounded skin. And as I mentioned, there's very little proliferation occurring normally. If you wound an animal, you can see uh, increases in the amount of stem cells that are uh, proliferating. And then as day seven comes around, when you start having uh, near wound closure, the rate decreases. However, if you make a wound on the receptor, receptor knockout that is uh, not responsive to IL-1, there's a marked decrease in the amount of stem cells that are proliferating. Okay? It's important to say it doesn't go back to uh, baseline level, right? Because obviously there's other things that affect proliferation. But the fact that removing one of the cytokine signaling is having a significant effect suggests that this is an important cytokine. Okay? So removing IL-1 signaling substantially decreases the proliferation status of the stem cell. And this is just a quantitative um, measurement. If we did, so this is a wounded animal, and this is if we do it uh, genetically. So again, you know, in the wild type animal, cast is a conditional knockout is our genetic model of wound healing. Like the regular wound increases about threefold the amount of stem cells that are proliferating. If you do a double knockout with the cast is 8 IL-1 receptor, you could bring, substantially bring down the stem cells. So again, both a normal wound and our genetic mouse model are behaving similar, similarly in response to IL-1 signaling and stem cell proliferation. Okay. So we had actually kind of an um, uh, unexpected result when we were starting to look at IL-1 signaling. So as I mentioned, we took the epidermis, conditioned the media from there, took dermal cells, the dermal fibroblasts, and condition media from there. So basically, we're just collecting all the, uh, not junk, protein that is secreted out from these different uh, uh, sections of the same tissue. And then we added those condition media to epidermal stem cells and just said, okay, which one of these can cause more proliferation, right? And I just showed you data that IL-1 alpha secretion is required for stem cell proliferation. But we were really surprised <laughs> when we got this data. So. Again, the normal proliferation rate of epidermal stem cells, not much. The surprising thing is that when we added the condition media from the epidermis, we also got not much, right? But that was the source of IL-1 alpha. What happened? Not only that, is that when we added it to the dermis, uh, from the dermal condition media, then we're getting multiple epidermal stem cell proliferation. So, to, so the model that this gave us was that when you downregulate cast phase 8 in response to a wound, that releases IL-1 alpha from the cell. But what it's doing is it's mediating epithelial mesenchymal crosstalk. Okay? So the IL-1 alpha released from these keratinocytes activate these fibroblasts. And then the fibro activated fibroblasts can then work back in a loop to activate the epidermal stem cells. Right? It's not a direct effect of IL-1 alpha directly on these epidermal stem cells. You're going through an epithelial mesenchymal, epithelial crosstalk, okay, in order to get this type of um, increase. And that is how you kind of change that normal balance between proliferation and differentiation, okay. And so this is accomplished through this uh, loop. Now, the, I talked a little about, so this is how you uh, stimulate epidermal stem cells, okay. But I mentioned this phenomenon that occurs during wound healing. So the hair follicle has its own pool of stem cells that are required for the regeneration of the hair. Again, hair falls out, it reforms. Upon wounding, the hair follicle stem cells migrate up into the epidermis to help close that wound. Because these epithelial, epidermal stem cells are enough for the regeneration, but not enough to hold, uh, quickly close a wound a hole in the tissue. So what the, uh, it seems like the uh, organ has uh, evolved is that it's going to recruit any stem cells from anywhere to rapidly close this wound and repair the barrier function of the skin, which is its major function, right? So anything that is required to close the gap in the tissue 
it, the system's going to take care of. So there's stem cells here, here, and here. They're all going to go migrate towards the womb. Okay, so the question is, is this occurring during the caspase 8 knockout? And to a large extent, I showed you this result before. So again, in green is the uh, KI67, which is the marker of proliferation, right? Obviously, the epidermal stem cells are going to be proliferating here. But what you can see is that there's a trail of proliferating cells in the hair follicle, similar to what occurs normally during a wound kind of a stuff. And this is the genetic model of uh, caspase 8 knockout. Uh, a genetic model of a, a wound healing using the caspase-8 knockout. So the question then is, is the hair follicle stem cell proliferation also influenced by IL-1 signaling? Because I told you the epidermal stem cells, these guys, is that epithelial mesenchymal loop mediated by IL-1 alpha. Are these hair follicle stem cells also under that same regulatory control? And so what we did is that um, we post-labeled uh, uh, proliferating cells with BRDU from wild type or knockout skin, and then you can get the uh, proliferation uh, marker of the hair follicle stem cells marked. Okay, and then you can isolate these proliferating hair follicle stem cells using uh, fluor fluorescence activated cell sorting facts. Okay, so a surprising thing that we found is that um, in wild type, there's not much hair follicle um, uh, prolif stem cell proliferation, and castigate knockout, it's uh, increased. And in the uh, absence of IL-1 signaling, that's substantially decreased. Okay, so it says, okay, this might be directly uh, same same as uh, what's a cap uh, occurring in the um, epidermal stem cells. Caspase 8 is releasing IL-1 alpha. It's activating the fibroblasts. The fibroblasts secrete signals. In this case, FGF7 and GMCSF to stimulate epidermal stem cells. Is it possible that these activated fibroblasts can also activate these hair follicle stem cells, cause them to migrate up? and help uh, do a wound. The surprising thing was that I don't want to take too much time to show negative data. This was not happening. Okay, IL-1 alpha is required, but it was not through this dermal fiber bus. Okay, so now then we have some problems, because what else is there to actually mediate it? It's not direct. Um, and the reason why that um, uh, we thought that it might be another player was because I, I was kind of very this is a very simplified diagram of the epidermis. In fact, uh, we think there's another branch of IL-1 alpha uh, that is required. And remember I told you that there's a lot of interaction between the different phase cells of the different phases that mediate, that can impact the behavior of the cells, right? So stem cells can be responsive to immune signaling, right? Why not check to see about this immune cell signaling? And where what kind of signals can mediate this skin stem cell effect? Now, the thing was that I told you that the epidermis is primarily stratified epithelia of different keratinocytes. But that was kind of an oversight because the epidermis is also studied with resident immune cells that are present in the tissue. Okay, It's not only keratinocytes. You have immune cells resident within the skin. In particular, you have this dendritic epidermal T cell, which is called gamma delta T cells in uh, um, the literature. And uh, work by a uh, former colleague of mine, Wendy Havren, who's at the Scripps Institute, what, Scripps, Scripps Research Institute, has shown that these gamma delta T cells in wounded skin themselves can secrete uh, cytokines that promote proliferation. So is, are these gamma delta T cells the missing link that we need between epidermal, keratin epidermal keratinocytes and the hair follicle stem cells? And so when we looked and stained for uh, gamma delta C cells, you can see that they're relatively sparsely present in the epidermis, but they're present in the hair follicle right near the hair follicle stem cell site. So here's a magnified view. You have the gamma delta T cells here in the hair follicle, and the stem cells would be around here. So they're in the right place to do something. So is the gamma delta T cells even activated during the uh, knockout? Well, you know, this is not coming out very well, but you have to trust me. Is that in the caspase 8 knockout, which is our model for wound healing, there's an increase in, uh, in the number as well as the activation of these gamma delta T cells. And one way of looking at the activation is that these gamma delta T cells are called dendritic epidermal T cells. And then they're dendritic because they have these long stretches, right? When they're activated, they become almost spherical. So that's a, a marker of their activation. 
So they're not only increased in number, but you're also activating these gamma delta T cells. So the question then is, are these activated gamma delta T cells the one responsible for hair follicle stem cell uh, proliferation? And again, we could take a genetic approach to this. So we can use the gamma delta T cell knockout mouse, right? So this re it lacks the receptor, so it, the, the gamma delta T cells are inactive. So in wild type, if we look at hair follicle stem cell uh, proliferation, again, the cat phase 8 knockout has a lot. If we remove gamma delta T cells from that um, uh, background, you can substantially decrease the number of hair follicle stem cells that are being produced or that are proliferating. Okay, so that this is basically that the IL-1 receptor is required for the gamma delta T cells to be activated. So IL-1 signaling is required for gamma delta T cell signaling, and that's required for proliferation. So the model that um, basically um, comes forward from this study is that when you wound the epidermis, so you have a downregulation of caspase A. And this downregulation of caspase A has uh, two branches dependent upon IL-1 alpha. The first one mediates an epithelial to mesenchymal loop, activating the dermal fibroblast that works back onto the epidermal stem cells to cause their proliferation. Another branch of the caspase 8 um, pathway causes IL-1-alpha to activate these gamma delta T cells. And together with another cytokine, leads to the activation of gamma delta T cells to cause the proliferation of these hair follicle stem cells that migrate up. Okay. So it's actually quite interesting that the system evolved two different pathways dependent upon the same cytokine to activate two different pools of the stem cells within a tissue. Okay? So, oops. So the question then is, what does this mean in terms of cancer? Because I told you that one of the goals of this uh, work is not only to understand the basic mechanisms regulating the wound healing response, but can this offer any insights into um, our understanding of how cancers progress, right? And I told you about these two different uh, studies that are actually quite old uh, about linking tumor genesis and, and the wound healing response. And I also told you that in a wound healing uh, aspect, you have the mobilization of multiple stem cell pools within the same tissue, right? I showed you evidence of the epidermal stem cells as well as the hair follicle stem cells all coming up to the epidermis to clear this wound kind of a thing. And it's actually quite interesting because most some recent papers have shown that something similar might be happening during cancers. So in basal cell carcinomas of the skin as well as squamous cell carcinomas, uh, where they were looking for the cellular origins of these different uh, tumors, both the hair follicle stem cells and epithelial progenitor cells have been uh, found to be present in those carcinomas. Again, some, similar to what's happening in wound healing, you're recruiting stem cells from the hair follicle as well as the one resident in the epidermis to promote the formation of these uh, carcinomas. And now, with, um, from our work and the work of others, people have also implicated the gamma delta T cells and the IL-1 alpha signaling in the uh, progression of these tumors. Again, so the same components and the same cell types are basically playing a role in wound healing, but becoming deregulated to form uh, these cancers. So this is actually kind of interesting because more recently, um, there's been work with cancer and caspase 8 um, deregulation. So um, in um, 2005, there's been shown that caspase 8 gene is inactivated in various gastric carcinomas. And you can find in the literature multiple examples <laughs> of uh, caspase 8 expression being um, affected during the uh, formation of tumors. So again, it seems that, again, the same downregulation of caspase 8 that occurs during wound healing is also being usurped in different cancers to remote uh, tumor genesis. And this implies something actually quite interesting. So a lot of people have thought that the downregulation of caspase 8 was a mechanism solely to protect the cells from undergoing apoptosis, right? So remove caspase 8, you can induce apoptosis, the cells can survive. Um, so I'm not saying anything that that's wrong, but what our work and others have uh, um, put forward is the possibility is that the loss of caspase 8 not only protects the cells and promotes survival, but activates all these other signaling pathways that help to make the tumor stronger, as well as promote signals that provide cancers 
uh, to form. So it's not only a protective environment, but it plays a more positive role in promoting uh, tumor genesis. Um, so just to summarize one more time, what we found is that the wound leads to the downregulation of cats BV, all the three different phases, the wound healing response. And um, what we're now uh, trying to figure out is what is the signal that leads a wound to cause the downregulation of cats BV. And I think I'll stop there because people are leaving. Do you have any questions? She's on the money Yeah. <laughs> now you can translate the thing. <laughs> so. I have three other stuff to talk about, but I need to take a break. Is that okay? Should we lunch? Avrei bisogno di una pausa se per voi va bene. <laughs> no yeah, way. It's okay. Okay. So we'll break for lunch. Pausa pranzo.